Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming to see my final seminar. Um, and I'm just really proud to be able to share the results of my research from the past few years for those that are in person as well as those in um, Zoom land. Before we start, there we go. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people in the ACT, the Watharong people in Victoria, and the Palawal peoples in Tasmania, um, as the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which this work was undertaken. And um, I also want to recognise their continuing connection to country as well as Wurundjeri, which is the Ngunnawal name for the Eastern Quoll and caring for them and their ecosystems since time immemorial. So firstly, a little bit about me. I've been lucky enough to have a range of experiences since finishing my honours degree, including working for uh, ecological consultancies like Biosis, EcoSure and Capital Ecology, in environmental regulation with the New South Wales Environment Protection Authority, in academia um, with the ANU and in science communication with the Woodlands and Wetlands Trust. I've also had the pleasure of working closely on frog ecology, leopard seal, spatial behavior, microbat and megabat conservation, bird banding and small mammal surveys and many more. For my personal interests, I like taking nature photographs, which some of them will be in this presentation and also playing Ultimate Disc. And I had the great opportunity of representing ANU and Australia at competitions throughout my PhD. So I want to thank the uni for um, supporting those ambitions of mine. Uh, without further ado, let's talk about my thesis on the reintroduction biology of the Eastern Quoll. My first chapter begins with a quote from Harry Sadler in his appropriately named book, The Questions Raised by Quolls saying, as I watch the quolls in that perfect moment of peacefulness and contentment, I realize that the happiness I feel in any given encounter with wildlife runs parallel with the awareness that such wildlife is a shadow of what it was in my parents' time or in my grandparents' time. The sorrow is there, but crucially, so is the joy. This thesis deals with the business of bringing a species back from the brink. And my hope is that the learnings um, that we have made along the way will encourage others to try things which at first seem impossible. Firstly, what is a reintroduction? Reintroductions are a critical tool that we use to reverse deformation or the loss of fauna and restore ecosystem function. Their aim as a tool is to establish a viable self-sustaining population within the species historical range and a reintroduction hinges um, on the passage of a population through three main phases. The establishment phase, where post-release effects drive population dynamics. The growth phase, which is characterized by high rates of growth. And the regulation phase, where density dependence tends to limit survival and recruitment. However, management decisions are always made in the face of imperfect knowledge. And this has historically led to low levels of reintroduction success. So how can we improve these success levels? They can be improved by employing what we call tactics, which are techniques which influence post-release performance and persistence. And these need to be guided by well-defined strategies, which is essentially an objective or a goal. So tactics can involve things like founder selection, preconditioning of the release environment, threat mitigation, and resource augmentation and can be informed by strategies such as maximizing survival and minimizing dispersal. To clarify this thinking, um, Batson and others um, in 2015 developed the Translocation Tactics Classification Scheme to provide a framework that allows us to identify, select and design tactics um, to achieve our defined strategies. And I made heavy use of this during my thesis. One of the key environment focused tactics is threat control. In Australia, we have suffered the highest rates of mammal extinctions of any continent. And this is due in large part to predation by introduced predators like red foxes and feral cats. So the fences are really critical to circumvent these threatening processes and arrest rates of decline. For example, this fence that you can see here is the one from Mulligan's Flat, which we worked with. And it's designed to prevent entry by introduced species from the outside, um, which is where this bushstone curlew is. 
um, but does not prevent climbing species from getting up and over like the eastern quoll did, and this will become important later in the story. Um, and these sanctuaries and havens have enabled the successful reintroduction of at least 38 species now. And really importantly, they give us time to develop the tactics that we need to enable native species to coexist with introduced species and other threats. This is known as coexistence conservation, and this is a concept that was developed by Evans and others this year. And importantly, sanctuaries also offer a really unique opportunity to conduct long-term large-scale experiments to understand ecological processes which we might not have been otherwise able to do. One such sanctuary lives uh, right on the doorstep of Canberra. It's Mulligan Slat Woodland Sanctuary and it sits on the northern border of the ACT and is a public set, publicly accessible 485 hectare um, area of critically endangered box gum grassy woodlands. It forms the site of the Mulligan Slat Gariru Woodland Experiment and treats both Mulligan Slat, which is this darker polygon in the upper right, and Gariru, which is the adjoining one to the south, as outdoor laboratories. And it's a really good opportunity to test um, frameworks and develop really important conservation outcomes, but it also shows how important formal partnerships are to bringing all this together. So for us, that was the managers in the form of the ACT government, the researchers of the ANU, and the communicators of the Woodlands Wetlands Trust. And the fencing has provided a haven into which locally extinct um, native species have been reintroduced um, within an experimental framework. So this includes the Eastern Betong, the New Holland mice, and the Bushstone Curlew. However, once these species were reintroduced a couple of years back, um, the, the role of the ground dwelling predator remained vacant. And one such predator is the Eastern Quoll or Mungani in the Nunawal language. Most of this species diet is insects, but they are known to hunt and scavenge small mammals, birds, reptiles, and frogs. And as a marsupial, it gives birth into a pouch similar to a kangaroo. It is sexually dimorphic as a species. So this is where the males are about 1.5 to two times the size of the females. This is a difference between 1.8 and one kilo. And unlike other coral species, they come in two different color morphs, um, which is the fawn and the dark. The species was historically distributed all down the southeast coast of Australia, but due to a combination of habitat destruction, predation by introduced species, disease and her human persecution, the species went extinct in the 1960s. But thankfully, they remain extant in Tasmania. However, evidence is mounting that the eastern corals down there are not doing really well. And if we want to not lose this species entirely, we have to create insurance populations. As a result of the efforts of the Eastern Coral Mainland Recovery Team, Eastern Corals have been successfully reintroduced to Matt Rothwell in Victoria, which was in 2003, and Mulligan's Flat in 2016. And this is the focus of my thesis. So I structured my thesis as a thesis by publication with six main chapters. Firstly, the extended context statement, which we just covered. Uh, chapter two, looking at trials and tactics of the reintroductions of the first three years. Chapter three, looking at how behavior affects reintroduction success, and that was the second trial. Chapter four, looking at movement and interactions in the third trial. And chapter five, which is investigating how we could use the learnings from all of that to inform species recovery efforts. And finally, chapter six, the concluding remarks. Of these, chapter one is complete. Chapter two and three are published, chapter five is in review, and chapters four and six are currently being finalized. Today I'll be giving a little bit of extra focus on those chapters that I haven't presented before. So looking into chapter two, which is trials and tactics. Here I've tried to present a real world example where tactics, again these are techniques which influence post-release performance and persistence, and an adaptive management framework, which essentially uses feedback from monitoring to inform future management actions or learning by doing. Um, how these improved reintroduction success. Across three successive trials, we investigated whether uh, tactics influenced 
survival and dispersal. And this involved monitoring founders for 42 days post release, so just a couple of weeks, and testing whether the probability of survival or dispersal uh, changed versus against trial, origin, sex, den sharing, and presence of pouch young. Now, in the very first release in 2016, we learned something really important is that quolls like to climb fences. Uh, in that first year, around 50% of the founders escaped over the fence into the surrounding landscape, some of which we were able to catch back and re-release into the sanctuary, or in the case of repeat offenders, put them back into Mount Rothwell. Um, but for some, the foxes did get there first. And that really reinforces how much of a threat foxes posed on mainland reintroductions, um, but also made us realise how important it would be for us to minimise dispersal in that first few weeks to maximise the number of founders that survived. So with that strategy in mind, we used Batson's uh, classification system to organise our tactics that I described earlier. And these were genetic and demographic selection. So essentially whether or not the founders were captive bred from Mount Rothwell or wild caught from different geographic regions of Tasmania. Behavioural preconditioning, which involved uh, habituating the founders with their release boxes and conducting some behavioural assays, which I will cover in the next chapter. Physiological preconditioning, which involved changing from mixed sexes being released in the first year to females only in later years to take advantage of their breeding physiology. Population size by adjusting the number of founders that we introduced each time we conducted a translocation. Pre-release intervention, which involved retrieving the quolls which had escaped over the fence. Threat control, performed by Mulligan's flat, um, its fence. Spatial configuration, where we adjusted where in the landscape we released the quolls. Release design, um, where we delayed the release of the quolls by one to two hours to kind of give them time to settle into the landscape. And finally, resource augmentation which um, is where we acted adaptively to supplement feed the founders in the second trial after we observed a bit of weight loss. Now, those were a lot of trials, um, a lot of tactics, but here is a trial by trial rundown of our results. So for the first trial in 2017, we brought in 16 founders, half male, half female, and they were both, they were either captive or wild born. And we translocated them in the pre-breeding period. So this was about mm, February and March. And in response, we ended up with about 50% survival, as I mentioned. So we noticed that the majority of the survivees were male, uh, female, sorry. So we adapted our tactics in the second trial to involve 13 founders, uh, females only, and adapted again to bring them in in the post-breeding period, um, which was around, June and July. Um, our result ended up being 92% survival. And we think that this is due to a combination of the fact that females post breeding by definition are bearing pouch young at the time of translocation. We think that that helped to anchor them to the release site, um, as well as allow us to introduce males via the pouch as pups. In the third trial in 2018, so I've got the wrong years there. We've got, this should be 2016, 17 and 18. Um, in the third trial in 2018, we, it was just about re uh, refining the tactics. So we noticed that there was no significant differences between the performance of the captive, found, uh, the captive ones or the wild founders. So we decided to get the most genetic bang for our buck and release wild founders only. And again, we were met with similar levels of high reintroduction success. So overall, did we improve reintroduction success, noting that our strategies were to maximize survival and minimize dispersal? Um, well, we measured the probability of survival as the first metric and the second one as the proportion of days moved between dens. That was our metric for dispersal. And we found that yes, these things changed across the three trials. Um, note that the letters on top of each of these bars refer to the uh, points that are significantly different from each other. So trial one for both survival and dispersal was significantly different to trials two and three. 
So question two is what mechanisms drove this? We found that female eastern quolls were, uh, they moved less frequently between dens than males. And those quolls that moved less frequently were more likely to survive. Interestingly, the proportion of days where founders moved between dens was found to be significantly lower when they were den sharing with another founder the previous night. So that suggests that site fidelity and sociality are important for reintroduction success in this species. So what are the implications of these results? While we acknowledge that our sample sizes were relatively low, the discoveries that we made were critical for achieving the result that we got. And a rigid experimental design might have dictated that we repeat suboptimal tactics like releasing males or doing it at the wrong time of year for comparability between the trials. But because threatened species reintroductions are inherently limited in their ability to source large sample sizes for replication and control, we believe that it's trials within an adaptive management framework that is the most pragmatic and informative option for assessing how effective your tactics are. So that was chapter two, moving on to chapter three. Here I explored how behavior can contribute to reintroduction success. Now, we know by now that founders need to identify resources and establish home range quickly in order to survive, but the strategies that served well in their source environment may not be well adapted to the recipient environment, which is where we release them. For example, a proactive individual that dominates by being bolder, more exploratory or aggressive and taking more risks may be more vulnerable um, when placed into a novel environment. Whereas a reactive individual that displays vigilance and takes fewer risks may outcompete proactive personalities by avoiding these threats in said novel environment. So behavior is how an animal's physiology interacts with its environment and thus behavioral selection as a tactic underpins everything from survival to dispersal to reproduction. For some definitions, personality refers to consistent differences in individual behavior and plasticity refers to the change in observable behavior over a gradient in space or time. So this kind of this kind of um, foundation is referred to as the behavioral reaction norm. So we got behavior on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And I made use of this to extract personality and plasticity from our measures. So how did we go about quantifying behavior? As part of the second trial, we conducted what we call behavioral assays or tests to um, find their behaviors by putting them in a pen that contained a den box at the far end. And um, that was something that we allowed the quolls to habituate to over time and would later become their release box. A stimulus in the middle, which had one of the following um, strapped to a wooden stake. It was either a visual stimulus in the form of a blinking bicycle light, a sound in the form of a masked owl call playing intermittently. And this is a natural predator of the Eastern quoll in Tasmania, a smell, which was a scat from another quoll put into a perforated jar, very nice. And uh, lastly, a control that had nothing on it. However, when we measured all of this and ran it through the models, none of these stimulus um, had any effect on the behaviors. Uh, so we ended up not including this particular factor in subsequent analyses. Uh, on top of the den box and the stimulus, we also have a food dish which um, is at the opposite end of the pen to the den box. And that was introduced at the beginning of each assay. And this will come into measuring giving up density, which I'll explain in a bit. Finally, there were cameras on the ceiling, which captured all the action and um, involved me watching it many years later. So here's some footage. Um, these are not from the cameras that I analyzed. These are from two other cameras, which were on the ground level and gives you a bit more idea of what they're doing. Um, these two were founders from Mount Rothwell with Agnes on the left, who is exhibiting a bit of vigilance behavior. So that meerkat sort of posture, whereas um, Noni on the right is certainly not being vigilant. <laughs> um, I ran two assays uh, per night 
across eight nights, giving a total of 16 assays per qual, after which they were released into the sanctuary. And yeah, a few years later, I came back to watch this footage using Boris, which is behavioral observation research interactive software to record how long each qual exhibited different behaviors like activity or vigilance. Now, this is our approach and I'll walk you through it. So we wanted to easily measure um, we wanted to measure easily quantifiable behaviors such as latency to emerge from the den, latency to reach food. So this is essentially time delay, um, time spent active and vigilant and exposed, giving up density, which is the amount of food that the quals ate despite the risk that was present, and the number of camera triggers. Because the enclosures were exposed to the elements, I had to account for weather conditions in um, their behaviors at the time of the assay. So to do this, I ran generalized linear models for each of the behavioral responses against temperature, precipitation, humidity, and moon phase, and um, extracted predicted values from the model, which essentially just upwards adjusts them for each of those conditions. Next, we removed uh, measures that were significantly correlated with each other because they were giving the same strength of response and then created two composite values um, based on principal, con uh, principal components analyses. We decided to create a proactive and re uh, reactive composite measure. So um, proactive individuals we decided to class as those that spent low time spent vigilant, low latency to reach food or emerge, high time spent exposed and high giving up density and reactive individuals were the opposite. Now that we had all of our behavior measures ready to go, um, we needed to find single values for personality or for plasticity to analyze. So we did this by extracting from that slope in the behavioral reaction norm, we extracted the intercept, which represents personality and the slope, which represents plasticity. Um, from each measure. And what we ended up with was two values per behavioral measure, which we then compared to survival and dispersal responses. Survival in this case was fate, so whether they survived or died, uh, weight and dispersal was number of dens used, mean distance between dens, days spent den sharing and home range. So uh, did we get a change in the behavioral responses over time? For some measures, yes. Latency to emerge, uh, latency to reach food, time spent vigilant, and giving up density significantly changed over time. This means that the quals were adjusting their behaviors over the time of the assays, which is pretty encouraging considering that their initial behaviors may not be optimal for the environment. So for example, for giving up density for that result, at the beginning of the assays, the quals were tending to give up after about three quarters of eating their food. Um, but by the end, they had habituated to this novel environment and were eating all of their food. Now, the real interesting results tend to happen here where we tested each behavioral measure. Um, so personality and plasticity against uh, fate, post-release weight, number of dens used and et cetera. And these graphs, which are effect sizes, um, amongst them, we found that in terms of personality, giving up density was significantly correlated with day spent den sharing, as well as home range. While in terms of plasticity, the time spent exposed in an enclosure was significantly correlated with mean distance between dens, and the change in time spent vigilant was significantly correlated with day spent den sharing. So what does this all mean? By conducting behavioral assays of um, that indicated individual variation, we were able to detect significant relationships between behavior and performance. And the interpretation of the results that you just saw are rather complex, but they gave rise to the following recommendations. So firstly, due to the increased ranging behavior of the reactive and the plastic individuals, potentially due to a lack of tolerance for other quals in their space, um, we suggest that proactive and rigid founders uh, will be the more successful ones for initial trials where conspecific interaction could maximize founder settlement. <clears throat> 
So what this study presents is a rare real world example of how practitioners can measure easily um, and easily quantifiable and ecologically relevant behaviors to predict performance in the field. And also means that we can dedicate our resources towards the most appropriate founders for the stage of the reintroduction that we're at. So that was chapter three, looking now at chapter four, which is the movement and spatial ecology one. So why should we care about this? As a reintroduction progresses, density dependent mechanisms uh, tend to increasingly affect population dynamics. This essentially means that as the number of um, quolls approaches the carrying capacity or the maximum number that can be sustained by the sanctuary, individual movements and habitat use might start to change when there isn't enough room for everyone to do exactly what they want. This is particularly pertinent for fenced reserves like Mulligan's Flat, where immigration is only possible by translocation. And so by studying movement, habitat use, and interactions between the quolls, we can see how density dependent mechanisms manifest in space and time. So uh, I designed a study where we compared the movements between two different groups. We had the residents on the left, which were born in the sanctuary, and the founders on the right, who had been translocated from Tasmania to supplement us with a bit more fresh genetics. And initially, we had planned for there to be two study periods. The first one being the baseline, looking at the baseline movement of the residents before the founders arrived. And then a second period called the release one, where residents and founders were able to meet and interact over the coming weeks. However, um, the batteries of the GPS collars performed far worse than worst case scenario predictions, um, and they lasted three to four weeks instead of months. Um, so what this left us with is a third study period where only the founders were being tracked because the collars of the residents had died by this point. And um, I guess this is the realities of working with wildlife technology. <laughs> but all of this was very unbeknownst to me when I started radio tracking the quolls every day and um, catching them up every few days to make sure that their collars were fitting and that they were maintaining condition. Note that the GPS collars were configured to collect a single location for each quoll every 15 minutes during nighttime hours. And then we radio tracked them each day on top of that to get their daytime den location. So here are all of the den locations that we found between 2016 and 2018, so not just the current study. And this really gives you an idea of how many spots they found in the sanctuary. And I'm not even accounting for dens that we used by uncollared quolls here. So it really gives you some context. So I'll take you through the main results, um, which include distances traveled per night, home ranges, habitat use, including nocturnal activity using GPS and diurnal denning using the radio tracking locations and conspecific associations. And here we were looking for differences between origins, study periods and morphs. So for our first result, we found no significant differences between these major factors, but it does give us an idea of what the major um, movement patterns are of all of the calls together. So they're traveling roughly one to three kilometers per night. And again, for some context, this is about the length of mulligans in some places. Next, looking at um, home ranges, and we can kind of see from, these are all the points of each individual with the residents up in the top left-hand corner and the founders in the bottom right. Um, and you can see that the residents are relatively clustered in space, whereas the founders are more spread out. Now, I'll mention at this point that each and every qual I ever met was given a name. And for the residents, they were Dawn, Delta, Ebony, Evie, Electra, Fauna, and Flora. And for the founders, they were Indiana, Juniper, Cora, Luana, Myrtle, Nova, Olive, and Pandora. So let's look at how these girls performed with their actual home ranges. So we looked at home range, which was a 95% contour, or basically the most clustered 95% of points, and that is the lighter polygon that you can see. And then we also looked at their core range, which is the most clustered 50% of their points. And um, that's the darker colored polygon. 
And again, you can kind of see that despite the founders traveling similar distances per night compared to the residents, the founders did move over, over a much larger area. And this is confirmed by the formal analyses where we found not only a significant, but a substantial difference where the residents had about a 10 times smaller home range than the founders. Next up, we looked at habitat use. So we use the National Vegetation uh, Information System to categorize the different habitats across mulligans because it's not uniform across space and time. Um, there is uh, mostly woodland going on in the middle and left sections, um, as well as you know, grasslands and regrowth and other sorts of habitat types. But to keep things pretty simple, I decided not to use the full breadth of eight different habitat types that the NVIS said were in mulligans. I chose to combine some of them that were similar. So for example, woodlands and open woodlands I combined, forests and tall forests I combined. And that gave us five major habitat types, which is eucalypt woodland, eucalypt forest, um, free growth, grassland and aquatic, which is just big down, down in the bottom corner. And here is our results for the nocturnal activity. We found a very clear preference of the calls towards using eucalypt woodland, but this makes sense, um, seeing that woodland is the dominant feature of the entire sanctuary and it takes up most of it, over 60%. So what happens if we adjust these metrics for habitat availability? What we find is that if we look at the frequency of locations per square kilometer of habitat, grassland comes out as the winner. And um, that's despite the fact that the grasslands actually only cover 15%. So they are showing an active preference. Um, we didn't find any significant differences between origin study periods and morphs for these, um, for these metrics. But I did want to kind of compare the nocturnal habitat use versus the denning habitat use. And again, having adjusted for habitat availability, you can see that grassland is the winner, but in the dens, they're more, their third, fourth and um, fifth place was a little bit more uh, spread out. For instance, the difference between um, their use of eucalypt forest for denning and for nocturnal activity is particularly stark. In addition to these vegetation types, so the polygon kind of spatial, um, data, we also looked at rasters, which essentially looked at whether overstory cover, understory cover and aspect, which is orientation of the landscape, um, had any bearing on where the quolls were going. And we found, again, no significant differences between our major factors of origin, period and morph. But we did find that nocturnal activity tended to occur in areas that were of low overstory cover with denning allowing a little bit more overstory cover. Overall, um, for both of these activity types, understory needed to be incredibly low. And very interestingly is that aspects seem to center really nicely on 200 degrees, which is south southwest facing. Um, however, what I intend to do before submitting my thesis is add an additional bar to each of these graphs, which shows availability of said habitat. And that will show whether or not it is just the quals using what is available or showing active preference for these different metrics. Lastly, for the movement stuff, we're looking at conspecific associations. And we use the GPS locations to determine how often the quals interacted with each other. We, did, we decided to deem this as any uh, two locations being within 50 meters of each other, which is about the industry standard for spatial behavior. And we compared every qual to every other qual's behaviors, uh, movements. So that's every qual's name on the y-axis and every qual's name again on the x-axis and looked at four different correlation indices. So these were proximity index, which is the proportion of fixes spent together versus not, Pearson correlation coefficient, which essentially is movement correlation. So if one qual went this way, did it also go that way or did it go a different way? Uh, coefficient of sociality is the third one where we look at mean distance um, from each other versus expected distance. And finally, conspecific, uh, sorry, coefficient of association, which is near 
versus total fixes. And what we found is some significant results. So for the second metric, which is again, the movement correlation one, we found that these were significantly lower in the settlement period and for fawn morphs. And this is the very first time we found any sort of example of morph affecting some element of their movement. So it's really interesting. From these results, we can confirm that yes, the founders have larger home ranges and um, this needs to be carefully managed to prevent misadventure or over dispersal. Um, in our case, that tends to be over the fence. Um, and the quolls displayed a really significant um, preference towards grasslands. And this gives us a great idea of what sort of habitat we should be looking for for future reintroduction sites. This is the kind of structure that they like. And it's clear from this, as well as some of our other work, that density dependent mechanisms are at work at Mulligans. So the population is probably at carrying capacity. So we are ready to start sending some of our extra calls off to other species recovery efforts. Final, final chapter that I'll be talking about today is species recovery. So since reintroduced populations are often intrinsically small and vulnerable, we really need to maximize the number of individuals that we have that are contributing to species recovery. We framed this particular investigation around how demographic parameters like survival rates and age classes um, can reveal threats to long-term persistence, as well as inform active targets that we can use to remove the species from the IUCN red list. How we did this is through regular monitoring of the population. Um, we collected demographic parameters by catching the quolls at 92 different um, trap sites, which you can see on the map. And these were standardized and the quolls were captured at least twice per year um, in the first few years. We used the capture mark recapture method, which essentially means we need to know individual identities between capture and recapture. So we just use microchips, similar as you would with your dog or cat. Um, to determine the population estimates over time. Along with capturing the individuals, we also collected data on body weight, condition, age, reproductive stage, as well as collecting scat samples, which contributed to the honors project of Samantha Shipley on qual diet and genetic samples in the form of skin biopsies, which is contributing to the PhD of Brittany Brockett, who's looking into qual genetic management. So here are our results. The population estimates over the last few years sort of indicate a story of establishment in 2017, growth in 2018 to 19, with a bit of seasonal oscillation going on there. And what we hope is the regulation phase from 2020 onwards, where the amount of up and down seems to have petered out. Um, for the last two, um, monitoring periods, the numbers came out at exactly 47. So we have inter interpreted that as the carrying capacity of Mulligan's flat. This is um, during May when the population is at its lowest. Now we kind of expected body weights to follow a similar trend, but in the opposite direction um, to stabilize or even go down as carrying capacity was reached, but that's not quite what we've seen. <laughs> Um, interestingly, the weights have risen in recent years, and I'm pretty sure we can attribute that to the La Nina. Um, and the condition of the sanctuary is much better, so they've probably got more food resources to go around. So we use these demographic results that came out of the analyses, um, so apparent survival and age and sex uh, ratios, to build stochastic population models, which is a population viability analysis. We use this to forecast extinction probabilities for the Mulligan's flat population under different scenarios, including uh, supplementations, which is adding individuals to the population, as well as harvests, which are removing individuals, for example, so we can send them to another um, species recovery uh, reintroduction site. What we found by running these PVAs is that if they, we do no interventions, which are additions or removals from Mulligan's Flat, the population has a 76% pop probability of extinction over the next 50 years. This is the light green line that is in, in the middle of the graph. Um, 
Now, expectedly, if we moved, if we removed even a single individual, this probability of extinction would go up to 100%, and that is the lower two lines in red and yellow. Um, but it's worth keeping in mind that this is mostly due to the fact that the eastern corals undergo a huge population um, kind of change throughout the year. Maximum densities tend to occur during summer when the, uh, when the pups leave their mothers for the first time and they have their lowest densities in winter, which is largely due to juvenile mortality. And this is the oscillation that you can kind of see in each and every one of these lines. Um, so you could refer to these extra pups who were born but never actually make it to the breeding season as the doomed surplus. So perhaps by removing juveniles uh, before the annual uh, mortality event, this could be considered saving the doomed surplus and they can then contribute to species recovery elsewhere. A good metaphor for this would be um, having, I guess, spillway gates out of a dam. So your dam is overflowing and um, you can kind of scrape off the top and not affect the actual amount that you have. We have done this at least once where we harvested six juveniles in 2018 and sent them off to Mount Rothwell and we did not see a corresponding decrease in the population. So a little, little bit of um, anecdotal evidence that this could work. So it's clear from these lines that we do need to supplement the population. And in fact, supplementing with only one female per year is enough to lower the probability of extinction to 0%. However, this does rely on the fact that the female must be bearing pouch young at the time of translocation. So she's a seven for the price of one sort of situation with six pups. And I also found that if you supplement with six mothers per year, then we can sustainably harvest 16 little baby females and 16 juvenile males later in the year to send to other sites. And best case scenario is if we bring in nine females from elsewhere, we can harvest up to 48 little quolls to send elsewhere. So the process of using these demographic results from our successful reintroduction to find sustainable harvest rates for our population means that we can now use these numbers to backcast the population size and area of occupancy we need to achieve a stretch goal. And um, our stretch goal is to remove the Eastern Quoll from the IUCN red list entirely within 10 years. This looks pretty daunting as a goal, but a stretch goal by definition needs to be ambitious enough in order to inspire the creativity and innovation we need to achieve um, really big goals and things that currently seem impossible. So I went on over to the IUCN red list and found out which criteria the Eastern Goal had triggered to end up in the endangered and vulnerable categories and found a reported population reduction in Tasmania by 52%. This is from an initial estimate of 20,000. And I also found that the Eastern Quolls are listed to only occur in two different locations, which are Tasmania and Bruny Island. And these both place them in the, in the endangered category. And on top of that, the, the species has undergone a decline in the extent of occupancy um, sorry, in the extent, uh, yeah, extent of occupancy, which is the area available to the quolls, and then the area of occupancy, which is the area that they actually use and occur in, as well as the number of mature individuals. And these all um, triggered the vulnerable category. So to remove the Eastern quoll from the IUCN red list within 10 years, we need to do two main things. First, we need to produce 4,600 individuals over the full 10 years to offset the reported declines. To achieve this, 460 individuals would need to be produced each year. So that's 4,600 divided by 10. Um, to raise the population to 14,200, which is the point at which it would no longer trigger the criteria for vulnerable. Based on a sustainable harvest rates, which we already figured out from Mulligans is 42, and our carrying capacity, which is 47, we would need a 40 square kilometer occupancy area with conditions that are pretty similar to Mulligan's um, to sustainably harvest the 460 
individuals we need per year and a total area of 475 um, square kilometres to sustain these individuals over the 10 years. Um, that is essentially 98 mulligans flats, um, not accounting for edge effects. The second thing that we would need to do is increase the number of Eastern Core locations to above 10 or 11. So it is important at this point to note what the definition of a location is to the IUCN. It refers to a geographically or ecologically distinct area in which a threat, single threatening event can rapidly affect all individuals. We interpreted this as um, a single threatening event being spatially and temporally explicit, so things like a flood or a drought, um, as opposed to a threatening process, which is spatially and temporally dynamic, like disease or climate change. So based on this definition, we believe that Mulligan's Flat and Mount Rothwell, having established density dependent and geographically distinct populations, should be considered locations in addition to Tasmania and Bruny Island. So that leaves us with only seven that we need to create in order to get them off the vulnerable list. Um, however, it's worth noting that Cardoso in 2013 found significant genetic structure across Tasmania um, related to ge geographic distance. So perhaps we need to consider whether or not Tasmania only counts as one location or it is many in and of itself. So by taking advantage of a rapid life history and harvesting the doomed surplus, we can maximize the number of individuals contributing to species recovery. And we can set our ambitious stretch goals, backcast what we need to achieve them to create actionable targets for species recovery. And the final recommendation from this study is that populations like Mount Rothwell and Mulligan's Flat are managed as a network of meta populations where decisions are based on each um, sanctuary's demographic or ge genetic status. So we have reached the end of my PhD seminar. So what is the take home message? I think it's best summed up by this quote by um, Francis Hodgson Burnett. At first, people refuse to believe that a strange new thing can be done. Then they begin it can hope they to hope it can be done. They see it can be done, then it is done, and all the world wonders why it was not done centuries ago. By working together and choosing not to accept extinction as the new norm, we can make positive differences for our wildlife and for our world. Don't ever let something seeming impossible stop you. I'd like to give a huge thanks to these and many, many more people who helped me uh, professionally and personally throughout my PhD and contributed to the return of the Eastern Quoll to the ACT. And I want to thank you all very much for listening. Oh, my goodness. Um, all right. So, Thank you, Belinda. Happy to take questions. Um, question time. <laughs> yes, all. So, I was going to say thank you so much for that. I really enjoyed it. Um, I love that you seem to be becoming a core client. A little bit. <laughs> uh, but um, my sort of observation of the question is that they're actually more like bees than you might think. Yeah. Uh, and that's the, your, your observation that denning habitat, or if it was a bee nesting habitat, is not necessarily the same thing as foraging habitat in your cuts of grassland. Um, and in your summary slide about movement, you, you emphasised, well, they're really grassland animals. But the data to me says, well, actually, they need both, which is what it looks like. So I just wanted you to comment on, given that it seems that they need well, at least they used more forested areas to then more, more often and then forest more like grassland. Do we have an understanding, or at least can you speculate on is that is denning are denning opportunities likely to be limited by habitat structure, you know, in that therefore they actually need to have a certain number of trees and, and so on? Or is it more that given the opportunity they might choose to be there, but if they were forced to be in a grassland? 
I would want to publish it. Great question. So what we know of the Eastern Quoll from a thesis um, by Jeanette Godsall, who was here at ANU, um, she found that the quolls tended to need um, ecotone habitats. So those that are the bridge between two different places. So for example, woodland and grassland. So in that regard, I think that it's clear from my data, the nocturnal activity or the foraging time is dominated by grasslands, which might prefer, give them more opportunity to find insects and other prey items. Whereas um, their dens might be more likely to be in the forested areas. And when they're denning, uh, I found that the majority of those dens were in fact underground in abandoned rabbit warrens. So they don't need the same level of cover to feel safe perhaps. I, I think you're right in that they do need multiple different habitat types and so not just a single uniform space. And the he ecotones are really important so that they can kind of migrate nightly across these two areas. Does that kind of answer your yeah. question? Thanks, David. Yeah, that was a fantastic seminar, I've got to say, and um, done a great job. And, um, uh, I was just wondering, can you say anything about, is there any hope for the Eastern Quoll on mainland Australia outside the fence? Um, I'd like to think there would be, and it'll take a lot of fine tuning the tactics that we need. So we do have another member of our lab, which is Tim Andrew Walther, who is working on outfoxing the fox and manipulating their behaviors to try to keep them away from our um, native species. So the Easterns might be a good candidate for that kind of trial. Um, I think the current situation is that the Eastern quoll is attracted to novel smells, doesn't recognize the fox as a predator, and the fox of course is attracted to them. So they're like magnets in the landscape. So if we can stop this one from coming from this way and kind of train the quolls to not uh, investigate the foxes, anti-predator training, then there's a good chance we could keep them separate in the landscape. There's also some really exciting work coming out from Kiara um, for advocating for mini safe havens, which are basically mini sanctuaries that you can build as a few of them throughout the landscape. And hopefully this would be um, kind of the quolls can move into and out of these spaces, but the foxes cannot. So one-way gates or those that are requiring microchips to get in and out. And that would give them kind of havens amongst a fox-dominated landscape to be safe, um, perhaps when they're pupping and things like that. And then they can move around and hopefully spread a bit like um, a marine park. You got the spillover effect. So that's kind of where we're moving. Um, so there's a lot of steps that need to be achieved before we go from sanctuary to living and cohabitating with foxes. And that sort of progression is um, coexistence conservation. So it's, it's the current battle that we're fighting. Thanks, Belinda. It's really interesting. Um, it covers so many different aspects of the things that could be impacting um, reintroduction to the quolls. And I guess I'm just wondering if you wanted to comment on with the behavioural assays that you did. In the context of somewhere like Mulligan's Flat or any fence sanctuaries, the individuals that are most likely to stay put, least likely to be dispersive and therefore head over the fence, are going to be your best option. If we're stuck with fence sanctuaries for the next 10 years while we're trying to work out coexistence conservation, is there any hope for conserving, or how do we protect those sorts of personalities so that we're not actually breeding up a whole bunch of really social quals <laughs> and losing that highly dispersal, high dispersibility from the population? Yeah, a really good point and one that I had to think about really carefully when I put in this publication. Um, so, of course, there's going to be genetic implications towards selecting certain individuals to put into a population. And over time, it, the a habitat itself will select for certain personalities. So I think that's why it's really important to keep supplementing. And the point that I 
uh, raised about bringing in, I think it was plastic, uh, anyway, two different habit, um, individual, sorry, two different personality types, um, the, the proactive and the rigid individuals early on would hopefully mean that they would have a, um, they would be represented in the population for many generations to come. Whereas I advocated for bringing in the opposite personality later on when they would be more likely to stick. Um, yeah, it, it, I at no point think that we should be adding a single personality type and that would be um, ill-advised for making sure that they're adaptive in the face of climate change. Um, but it's balancing those different tactics and the effect that we do want them grounded at this point. And it's worth noting entirely that these personalities, um, it might be the other way around if we're reintroducing beyond the fence. So it's the, the ground on which we're kind of making these decisions is constantly shifting. So we need to adapt them for every context that we come across. Zoom, do I? Yes. <laughs> I remember in one of your, I think one of your talks out at Mulligan's, you said something about one of the animals, whether it was the betons that constantly turned the soil. Uh, the betons, yeah. Okay. And you said it was going to, you expected a large increase in habitat viability, partly due to that, due to the amount of soil that they overturn every year. Um, yes, that is the work of Catherine Ross, who is sitting yeah. in the second row. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if there's any association between where the betons prefer and perhaps the, uh, the word? effects of the <laughs> betons and how they're changing the landscape or their interaction. Does one depend on the other more than one might think? Or? You mean interactions between the betons and the quality? No, the, their effect on the landscape. So the betons are improving the landscape according to the research yeah. out there. There's, there's, it's a complicated answer. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe not yeah. suitable for. I just, because that, whether it um, interact with the preference of the quolls. Mm. So whether the betons are creating habitat for the quolls. Yeah. Potentially. And on a kind of site-based level, the diggings will disturb the soil and expose insects, presumably. So that's most of their diet. So I'm sure they'd be happy um, following the diggings of the betongs throughout the landscape. Over a longer time scale, yeah, perhaps, but that's not something that I've looked into. Um, what I am currently looking into is whether or not there's any sort of um, spatial uh, segregation or interaction going on between the betongs and the quolls, and you'll just have to watch this space for that. Okay. Uh, one last question. If anyone's got a burning question to ask? Is there anything online? All good. <laughs> All right, then. Well, Thank you, Belinda, for a fantastic talk and well done on a fantastic uh, PhD project as well. Join me in thanking her. Uh,